Welcome everybody to our final la uh, live stream. So this is our 15th live stream and also our very last one. Um, it's also special because our guest today is going to be my wonderful teacher, Karen. Um, so for those of you who do not know her, uh, Karen Miller Packwood is principal bassoon of the Oregon Symphony and she previously held principal bassoon positions with the Jacksonville and Shreveport Symphonies. Uh, under the umbrella of the Oregon Symphony Sounds of Home series, Karen recently curated and performed in a chamber music program with commissions from local composers in conjunction with the Audubon Society of Portland to raise awareness of the impact of climate change. A native of Queens, New York, Karen holds a bachelor's from the Juilliard School, a master's from Rice, and an advanced certificate from the University of Southern California. Her teachers include Whitney Crockett, Frank Merrily, Stephen Maxim, and Benjamin Caymans. So yeah, welcome Karen. How are you? I'm great. I'm Good. excited. Yeah. Thanks so, for having me. how have you been holding up in the uh, during quarantine? Obviously, I know because we've talked during our lessons, but for everyone else watching, uh, it's it's been interesting. But you guys are keeping me sane. Uh, the lessons and um, uh, the bassoon without borders camp, which was super fab, and we're working on a winter session. So, um, just projects. Projects are the answer. Yeah. Super cool. Um, so, without any further ado, I will bring on our player for today. Uh, his name is Chris, and let me get that set up, sorry. Um, change that. Yeah, so Chris, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Can you hear me? Uh, you're muted still. Oh, he's muted. Hello? Yeah, hi. Oh. Yeah. Hi, I'm Chris. Um, I'm a bassoon player, obviously. Um, I'm home in Atlanta, and I'm uh, currently doing my fourth year at the Colburn School with uh, Richard Bean. Cool. Um, yeah. So today, Chris will be playing the exposition of the exposition of the Mozart Concerto. So I will get that pulled up right now. <laughs> Great, that was um, wonderful. So yeah, I'll just let you guys get to it. Awesome. So Chris, I said this to Teddy, but your Mozart is really excellent. Um, so it's in, it's just in really, really tip top shape. We're just gonna address like super tiny details, which is kind of a endless process with the Mozart. Um, so um, what are the two most important things about getting out of a preliminary round? Um. <laughs> to distill it down to like the basics, the super basics. Um, I mean, I hate to make it sound so cold, but I assume when you have that many bassoonists, it would come down to like precision, honestly. Um. <laughs> is important but it's but the two the two like primary things that people are listening for in a prelim round are pitch and rhythm okay <laughs> super, i mean like we're talking super super basic but okay. you would be surprised at how hard it is to accomplish the basics like mm -hmm. no matter how skilled of a player you are um especially if you're you know flying somewhere new and you're in a new environment and you're like a little off center so uh, the first thing we're just going to address is pitch and rhythm. Um, Mozart Concerto starts with a major triad, and we want to play the triad 
as it is, not as not in uh, what is it equal temperament, but you want to hear the third a little lower, you know, hear that fifth nice and wide. Um, and then the most common pitfall pitch wise in the Mozart is in bar three. We have a sharp low F and a flat E flat three. Um, that's kind of like a that's one of those things where if you have committee members that are not bassoonists and they hear that over and over and over again, they're gonna be like, why can't anyone play that in tune? You know, right. mm -hmm. and then one person plays it in tune and everybody relaxes and then people are listening in a different way. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know if you're all warmed up and ready to go, but um, I'm gonna warn the audience that um, with the Mozart, it is such detailed work that we're gonna have a lot of stop and start here. Normally, I like to have a more expansive view, but. Um, but we're going to be talking about really, really nitpicky details. So let's just go ahead and hear just the very opening statement. Fantastic. Yeah, that really is quite beautiful what you're doing. Um, let me just hear B flat, B flat, F, F. Mm -hmm. Good. Good adjustment. Good adjustment. Now let's hear. Dun, din, dum. Great, great. So now let's just play the first three bars with that same level of attention to finding the core in the center of the pitch. Great, 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 excellent. I'm hearing the D as just a tiny bit, dum, dum, de, da, da, a little bit high for the major third. So just play that once more. So, so in your practice, just listen for that. Make sure that it sounds like the third. It should be a little softer and a little lower. Um, and then what are you using on your E flat? Are you using the uh, top pinky key in the left hand? Oh, uh, no, I'm just doing one, two, and then um, first finger off. Okay. Uh, can you do me a favor and try it with the top pinky in the left hand? Let's just see what that does to the pitch. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And the odds are that the low F is going to be sharp, <laughs> right? Um, and so we want to use a sharper fingering for the E flat just to match. Mm -hmm. um, good. And then going on, it's very easy for these grace notes to get a little swallowed. Ba -da -ba 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 -da -ba. But we want to sing. Dee -da 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 -dee -dum -dum. Dee -da -da -da. Grace notes are people too. Okay, so let's hear that. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, that's in the right direction. So do me a favor. Let's just play a high G and just sit on it and sing and find the resonance and the openness in the sound. Okay, great. Now play that G as your grace note. Great. 
Beautiful, beautiful. And you did, without me even having to say it, you did it on the next one as well. It's very easy for that G to sound rushed through. But it's an opportunity to just float that phrase a little bit. Um, now, the only other micro comment I have about this is that bar 40 is rushing ever so slightly. So when I listened to the recording, the opening tempo felt really nice and steady at 116. And then from 40 on, it was at around 120. These are, again, just like super tiny nitpicky details. Um, but if you want yours to stand apart in a good way, that is one thing you could address. Um, and I noticed that um, whenever we had the scalar 16th notes, like at the end of you know 67, uh, the last two bars of the exposition as well, it just pushes ahead a little bit. So finding the energy in the phrase without rushing. So the, the key to a good Mozart is having energy and poise. And the two are kind of at odds with each other, right? It's, it's very easy to play an energetic Mozart that just kind of like rushy. And it's, it's very easy to play a staid Mozart that's very poised and doesn't have a lot of energy. So finding the balance, I, th I think that's, Probably the most brilliant thing about Mozart, why people love it, is it's so balanced. Mm -hmm. um, so let's keep that in mind and go on. Let's start at the F arpeggios, and let's hear as much energy and poise as you can as you can muster. Fantastic. It's really just so, it's really, really lovely. Um, excellent. So when you start this phrase, now Teddy enabled my screen sharing, so I'm going to be brave and show everybody um, something. When, when you're playing a classical era piece, um, you need to be really aware of what is an up bow and what is a down bow when you're choosing your phrasing. Um, and in this piece, it's opened by the violins. They have the main theme. So the, the best thing that we can do as bassoonists that we often forget to do is watch the violins. All right, I'm going to start that one more time so you can see what I'm talking about. Watch the bow. Okay, so we're just going to watch that one more time. Okay, sorry, I stopped before it was done. Okay, so it's down, down, up, down, down, up, down, up, up, down, up. Okay, so in order to get down, down there needs to be space bum bum right because they've got to reset the bow and then we're leading team batam bum and then team batari that's different that quarter note is connected dum down up okay so we have the violins doing that and what are the basses doing bum 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 right and in in the continuo in classical music, there's always a direction. There's bum 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 five 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 one one one, right? So we have release in the violins and direction in the basses, and our phrasing needs to capture both. That's why it's so complicated to get this right. So dum dum team ta dum dum team ta da dee. Okay, give it a try. Beautiful. 
beautiful, beautiful. My only comment is if you're going to do an up bow, it's not going to have the same attack. Dum, dum, dee, da, tom, dee, da, tom. One more time. Fantastic. That, yeah, really beautifully done. Um, everything in Mozart is phrase off. Never tum. Right. And you're not doing that. You're, you are phrasing off, but the beef, the last note could be even more mm -hmm. uh, phrase stuff. Let's just hear <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And really go for the first one. So you have somewhere to come away from <laughs> Yeah, softer tongue. So let's talk about tonguing for a second. Where is the reed hitting your tongue? Like just above the... Uh, I'm like, where is it? Tough one. Uh, here, maybe? Yeah, okay, yeah. Close to the tip. Okay, so um, there are lots of different ways we can tongue. Varied articulation is one of the most important tools that we have in classical and Baroque music. Um, and so I would suggest playing with the tip of the tongue for the shorter things. And then to get a more da, dee, da, dum, a little further back, a broader, like a D sound. So, so without playing, just say la, 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 la. Ta 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 ta, and then da 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 da. Yeah. So what I would do is here. Da 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 ta da da. I mean that's that sounds great. Yes, that. Now on the scale up. You're doing kind of a brushy stroke, which is absolutely legitimate. Um, I personally prefer a, a more playful short to bring out the differences between the more horizontal lines and the more vertical lines. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, so play with it as we oh, Yeah, even shorter. Da, 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 da. Like sparkle, sparkle. Okay, do me a favor. Do it even shorter once. Just really playful. Yeah, I mean, that is that is my preference. Again, you know, you can listen to 12 recordings and they're all, everybody has their way of doing this and doing it long is totally legit. But I think it it makes it clearer for the audience when you have versus right? I think it makes it clearer when we're in a lyrical place and when we're in more of a, like a percolating bubbly place. Right. So, so think about that. Okay, let's move forward. This was all fantastic. Let's go ahead to the top of the second page. Oh, that is so sparkly and wonderful. I love it. I really, really love it. My only comment is that it's more on the energy side and could use just a little more poise. Mm -hmm. 
para pa pa pim para pa pa pam pam pim pam pira pa pa pam 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 piro para piro Wonderful, wonderful. So you're doing an excellent job of, of staying in the poise until you get to upward scalar passages. And then you just get too excited. You're like, yo, dicka 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 tea. And you did the right thing by making up for it on the tum dicka 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 tea so that you stayed in the in the zone. Um, and I think a little bit of that is okay. A little bit of like that push pull as long as the big beats line up. Um, but that might be a tiny bit more than I would recommend. So let's do the, that whole passage one more time. And when you get to the yum, ta -ta 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 -ta, keep the energy, but, but don't push. Just let it come out. Yum, ta -ta 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 yum. <laughs> nice yeah yeah that's that's the idea you're still so that time you took a little time on the high f but we didn't rush before and so we got a little behind so just work on just like ironing you know the the push and pulls i love them i i really do and i think you should do them just make them as subtle as you can um while still doing them um so that's just something to work on so i just wanted to take a moment um this reminded me uh, to give a word of advice for how to prepare something like this for an audition. Um, one really useful tool that you have is a recording device. Um, nobody ever wants to record themselves, but it is literally the most important thing you can do when you're preparing for an audition. There is no such thing as recording yourself too much. When I'm preparing for an audition, I record one thing every day, and the next day I listen to it. Uh, because it's too fresh. You're not going to hear it objectively. Um, so you want to just sleep on it and then listen to it. And when you listen to your recording, um, I recommend listening to it five times in a row. Uh, so if you're just, if your excerpt for the day that you recorded was this exposition, you would listen back once just for rhythm and turn your metronome on once you, once you get the tempo at the beginning. I don't know if your metronome has this like tap in button, but you can just tap with yourself to get the, get the, you know, and then you keep yourself honest. You're like, oh, I'm at 120 now. When did that happen? You know? Um, so listen to yourself once for pitch, listen to yourself once for vibrato, listen to yourself once for tone, listen to yourself once for articulation, right? Find the qualities that that excerpt is demanding and listen to it with an isolated focus on those specific things. Because when you only listen to one element of your playing, you hear so much more. And people on a committee, there are 12 people on a committee or nine people on a committee, each one has their pet peeve. So one person's gonna be like, oh, I can't do it, like, unless it's exactly rhythmic, no, you know, and one person's gonna be like, I hate people who have like vibrato on some notes and not other notes, you know. So what you need to do is be a committee member for each element of your playing to iron everything out. Um, so that's just my general advice. Um, it's, you know, no matter how many times you do that, you're still gonna find stuff. <laughs> I don't think anybody doesn't find stuff, right? So it's an endless treasure mine. Um, okay, that said, how are we doing with time, Teddy? Should we keep going? Chris, do you want to keep going a little bit? Uh, sure. Maybe let's just hear, um, just, just uh, you know, to after the high F. Okay. Thank <laughs> you. 
Nice. Love it. Um, yeah, your ideas are fantastic. So the key is to find a way to present those ideas exactly in rhythm. And right now we're mostly in rhythm. Um, but that is probably the one of most the most challenging things about performing Mozart is keeping all of those tracks in your mind going for the ideas and the articulation and that you're thinking about so many things, but that pulse needs to be there. So right now on your dum 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 that quarter note at the end of the bar is a little early. dum 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 make sure that you give the half note time. Um most of the rests at 90 were solid, which is really hard to accomplish. So congratulations. Um, coming in right after that. But then the yum bum 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 but it was a little rushy. Bum bim bum 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 body. Okay, so let's let's do it one more time. Um one thing I want to say about this is in your practice, you're doing all of the hard work. You're you're listening to things, you're recording yourself, you're picking things apart, you're like polishing the stones, you know. And then when you go to play, you really just want to focus on a normal performance. You just want to hear bum, 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 and just sort of relax into just playing in tempo um, because everything you've practiced will be there if you just relax and play in tempo. So let's try that. Oh, I love it. I love the improvisatory quality that you're bringing to it. And I love that your articulations are varied. That's fun. I think that's really light and charming and people will like that. Okay, do you want to try it one more time and go all the way? Wonderful. Yeah, that that really that definitely fixed that um on the half note on the ba 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 dum. The first three are in time and the last one's just like a split hair late, just a tiny tiny bit. And then on these yum pum 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 bottom, just like you did ti dum ta dum ta dum ta da ti da ti da da yum pim pum ta da dum. Let me just hear right there. Yeah, so it's really easy as a wind player to get into these habits of ta 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 ta. Think about that if it were a string player. How would they bow that? Dum 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 da dum. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And and part of the struggle for us with the Mozart is that it's required at such a young age and we learn these things the way we did and then we mature emotionally and musically and then we have to undo all these things and and so I think just listening is the key like if you can listen with a focus on the orchestra um that really helps sort of like reframe the piece um yeah cool do you want to do you want to keep going or how are you doing 
um, yeah, we can keep going. It just okay. gets worse as we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this will be the last section. We will end as after the trills. Okay. Beautiful, beautiful, awesome. Okay, um, I want to give you another crack at the recap, um, just to incorporate some of the things we're talking about. Still, it's it's super fresh. Um, and then on the nonschlags and the trills, I think either goes. You can do you can do without or you can do with, but I think you want to be consistent through the section. Okay. And I would I would probably personally be consistent. You know, if I did nonschlags the first one, I would do nonschlags the second one. Um, it's it's hard because you want to create variety, but there also needs to be a certain amount of consistency for people to just feel like they mm -hmm. can relax. They know what you're going to do, right? Um, um, same same concept that we were talking about in the E flats, the bomb bomb. That's a honky note on the bassoon, man. Mm -hmm. Right, it's really easy for that to get out of control. So think, boom, boom. If you were a horn player, boom, boom, or a violin player, think of it, another instrument how they would approach that. Yeah, yeah, that's a much more rounded, controlled um, attack. Good. Yeah, good. Um, okay, so let's give you another shot at this opening. We want boom. So the half note both releases, but then the D comes out of it in a way that you've been leading. Does that make sense? Great, yeah, yeah, and not di da da, but di da dum. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. And on that note, um, just a couple of times throughout this session, um, I've heard notes that are released a slight bit abruptly to get a breath or to finish a phrase. And um, every single note should have a bloom, should have a, you can think of ending the note with um. Uh, so where was it? I think it was an F, boom. Uh, yeah, let's start from the arpeggios. I think it was that F. Let's try that. And then when you get to uh, ding, dong, bim, boom, boom, to just release the notes evenly, dum, dum. Oh, the exposition? Uh, no, so for, starting on the E flat arpeggios one more time. Nice. Yeah. It's it was the A flat before the low B flat. So, you know, technically we're doing dum bum. We've got it, we've got a big jump with our thumb, but nobody knows that. Um and so we need to finish before we switch. Dee da da dum bum. Let's just hear that. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So just when you're listening back your five times, make one of them for note endings mm -hmm. to make sure that we're being really mindful and not, it's so easy to just like throw it away, like 
You're looking ahead. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I got nothing, Chris. You sound so, so good. I mean, do you have any questions for me? Um, I don't know. It's, um, I, I always find myself feeling with this piece that um, the way I would like to hear it performed is probably not the way I would want to hear or want to play in an audition, rather. And uh, it's, it, you know, they, they kind of exist in two separate worlds for me. And that's something, I'm, you know, I mean, what, do you have any thoughts on that? Cause I just feel like, um, I don't know, especially for things like, you know, you take an orchestra audition, summer festival, blah, blah, blah. You, you know, that kind of Mozart is very, you know, pitch and, pitch and rhythm, like you said. And then, I don't know. I don't know if this is just me. Uh, imagining things or <laughs> oh no no it's it's super it's a super concern especially with solo whatever your solo is you know how much personality can i bring to this and um <clears throat> i'm not sure i'm the right person to ask because i tend towards the you know have a big personality like that's what music's about you know right. people want to feel interested and inspired and as long as it's stylistically appropriate which everything i've heard you do is um, you know, I, I personally on a committee, if I heard this Mozart, I would be like, this person has something to say. I love it. I want more. That said, like a different person who's more traditionalist in the American school or whatever might have, it might rub them wrong. So right. I would say, um, it depends on the group you're auditioning for, know the traditions of that group, listen to their recordings, talk to people. Some groups are more experimental and fresh and energetic, and some groups are more about like tradition and, you know, um, crossing your I, T's and dotting your I's, you know? So, um, so know the group that you're auditioning for, for how far you can push that. Um, and then in general, um, in the earlier rounds, play it safer, just be more predictable. Like don't stick out. Mm -hmm. um, that's just my, this, again, everything I'm saying is just my advice. Like, save it for the finals. Once the screen comes up and they can see your face, then, or these days, hopefully the screen will actually stay up the whole final round, even better. But once you make it to the final cut where they're hearing you for 40 minutes, you know, you're going to play a lot of repertoire. I think you can take more risks. I think you can really show them who you are because if they don't like it, then maybe that's not the right fit for you. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, one of my favorite things I played for Fagia, I don't know if you know him in the Minnesota Orchestra, and he was he was just like, I just play like me. And if they like it, great. And if they don't, it wasn't right for me. And I, I, I really respect that. I think like be as true to yourself as you can be while still respecting the music. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the right fit for you will happen, you know, like you're, you know, if it's the wrong place, then you don't want to try to fit your creative self into a box, you know, it's better for you to be in a place that respects and likes that. So, and every group has different traditions. So I love it. <laughs> if I heard that, I'd be thrilled. Um, but I'm just one person out of many committee members, you know. Mm -hmm. So ask, ask that question of everyone that you play for. Ask them what they think. Take a poll, you know, that's a good idea because these things are so subjective. You have so many opinions. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is amazing how some, some committees, you know, when the audition is over and you hear the comments, you're like, were we in the same room? Like, you know, you just, it's so subjective. So you might as well have fun. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Do you have any other questions? Um, uh, not really, actually. <laughs> okay, awesome. Well, if you do, you can just email Teddy and he'll put you in touch with me. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, beautiful work. Okay, okay. Okay, we'll do. Hi everyone, so we're moving on to our Q&A session now. Uh, thank you so much, Chris. So yeah, our first question is from Elias Packwood, Karen's son. And he asks, what do you like most about playing bassoon? 
Oh, everything. I don't know. I just I think it's the perfect voice. It just fits me. Thanks for asking a question, Elias. Yeah. Um, and I guess this next question, uh, anonymous, is somewhat related. They said, how did you originally become interested in a bassoon? Um, okay. Uh, when I was eight, my Hebrew school teacher brought her Juilliard quintet to play a concert, and it was red and shiny and sounded super weird and cool, and I just knew I wanted to do it. And so I asked my parents every year, um, are my hands big enough? Until they were at 13. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Um, let's see, let me find our next question. So Daniel from Argentina. Hi, Daniel. He asks, wanted to ask Karen her thoughts on sound. She has a beautiful and flexible sound. So how is her search and which are the ways uh, to even it up, ways to work control and expression? Oh, wow. You know, uh, I, think that, I think that my answer to that is going to be, it's all in your ear. Uh, if you pick, like if I pick up somebody else's setup, you know, I might sound weird for a minute and then I'll figure it out and sound like myself. So I think it's just concept. So uh, my advice for developing tone is listen to singers that you love. Um, I really love Fritz Wunderlich, Dietrich, Dietrich Fischer Discow, Kathleen Battle. Um, just, just listen to singers and try to imitate what they're getting. There should be a, a sparkle and um, a really vocal quality to what you're doing. Yeah. Um, so let's see, our next question, uh, anon anonymous again, they ask, who were your most influential teachers and mentors? Um, I have to say, I, th I literally think about this every week I go through and I'm like so grateful for the people that have influenced me, but, um, I think you get something from everybody you work with. Um, and I've been super lucky. I got to work with Stephen Maxim when he was, 83 um that totally blew my mind and changed the way i approached the instrument and um i worked with frank morelli and whitney crockett was so inspiring i got to hear him play every week at the met that's probably the most i learned was just listening to him play and then uh ben ben caymans there's like no words for the amount of mentorship that he provides for his students and um he just go he really goes there with you and spends the time um, working on reads. <laughs> it's probably the most important thing you can get from a teacher is learn how to make reads. It's super important to, um, for your experience. Um, so yeah, I am, I'm super grateful. I've, I've been lucky to have a lot of great mentors. Yeah, and if uh, people watching who might not have watched uh, our previous live streams, we do have sessions with Frank Morelli and Ben Caymans. So just quick plug. Um, anyways, um, someone asks, let's see. Um, if you were to give aspiring bassoons one piece of advice, what would it be? Work hard. Um, find the balance. Find, find what really motivates you. Create projects and goals for yourself. Um, make sure you're with the right teacher. Um, your teacher should make you feel like you have so much work to do and you can do it. Um, if you feel overwhelmed, communicate that to your teacher. Um, so that they can adjust the workload. If you feel under challenged, communicate that to your teacher. Um, so much of our trajectory is just the work that we're doing. And so much of that is based on the assignments that we get. So making sure that the goal you have for that week is the right goal is the key. Yeah. Um, let's see, I think a couple more. So uh, we have, uh, let's, where is it? Sorry. Um, what? What music are you playing right now? So I guess kind of like what's on your stand? What's um... Um, I'm super excited because I just ordered $150 worth of music from Trevco for my students and for myself. Um, that's all unaccompanied bassoon solos. Um, so I've got a ton of great music on my stand right now. Libby Larson wrote a jazz variation and Russell Platt wrote songs, Kirkland wrote songs and just exploring, which is really fun. Yeah, um, let's see, I think we have uh, three questions who are kind of similar. I think these are our last ones, actually. Um, so it's, uh, have you done any experimentations with the reads during quarantine? Um, can you talk, sorry, let me find it. Um, how has your read making changed throughout the course of your career? And then finally from Barton Kane, uh, can you talk a little bit about your read making style? Did you have to make any adjustments for Portland weather when you moved there? 
and how has your um, read style changed at all over the years? Okay. Yeah, so yeah. three questions in the similar vein. About read. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's funny. I laughed when you said, how has your uh, read style changed over quarantine? Because before quarantine, um, those who know me um, know that I've I have about five shapers on my desk. Um, so this whole last year before quarantine has been the search of the right shape for me. And I feel like I finally sort of figured it out and then quarantine happened. And so I actually have not been making reads because I made probably like 300 reads this last year. Um, um, I'm not sure I'm gonna remember all of those questions. Um, yeah, the so um, I think- the second um, after the quarantine one, it was, um, I think these two are basically about the same. How has your read making changed throughout the course of your career? And then um, from Barton Kane, they were talking about your style. Did you have to make any adjustments for Portland and how has it changed over the years? Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so yes, my reads have changed unbelievably over my career. Um, when I studied with Frank Morelli, I was playing very heavy, long reads. And then I went to Maxim, who was playing really short, light reads. And then Ben Kamen's teaches this middle of the road style, um, the Hertzberg method, and that I stuck with for 20, 10, how long? I don't even know how long I've been out of school. Um, but I stuck with that um, until this last year when I started experimenting. I heard Andrew Brady play um, at NYO and I was like, give me that read. What's, <laughs> I was like, teach me all about this. And I ordered his shaper that night. Um, and that just sort of opened this can of worms. So I have I have a Fox One, a Nockenhauer, um, the Fox K, I have this a CDN. Um, and then I've been trying some of those Donzi 9.2 reads. I went and geeked out with Whitney a little and he showed me the Nunez style that sort of blew my mind. So um, they have changed a lot in the last year, but you know, I'm tenured and I've been on my job. Before that, even though I was making the same style of read, I found that I was leaving them heavier and heavier and heavier and heavier <laughs> through my career. And I think a lot of it just depends on your space. You know, the, the hall I play in is huge and dead and my orchestra plays very loud. And so I was just adding wood, you know. And so now I'm trying to come back down and bring the reads to me a little bit more and quarantine is very helpful for that. To Barton Kane's um, question about Portland, the weather here is so inconsistent, it changes nine times in an hour. And so uh, if I have a challenging solo, I will literally have like 12 reads on my stand. And what works at the beginning of a concert is not going to work at the end of the concert because it started raining or the barometric pressure dropped or whatever. So I just have, you know, I just have learned how to monitor the weathers and just have a variety of options at the go, which is not ideal, but we oh. make it work. Wow, yeah. Um, I think that is all of our questions. We had a lot, but we managed to get through them without um, going on for too long. So yeah, so speaking of Barton Kane, who asked that last question, I want to thank them so much for helping us to sponsor this series. Uh, they have been invaluable. They have been super helpful to me throughout this whole process. So um, if you are ever in the market for GSP Kane, very high quality, go check them out. Uh, you can see the link between uh, below our faces. And yeah, so they have a large variety of shapes, um, sizes, not sizes, shapes, profiles, and types of cane. Um, you can find, I think, almost all of the different shapes that Karen just mentioned just now, um, probably on their site. So yeah, definitely check them out. Um, and I also want to thank everyone for um, being a part of this series. I want to thank all of our amazing artists for being so generous with their time and contributing and leading these sessions. I want to thank all our players for being, I guess, pretty brave and playing in front of a live stream to be immortalized on the internet forever. And I want to thank everyone uh, of you for watching our live streams. Um, obviously, there would be no masterclass without an audience, so thank you all so much. I will be ending our live stream today. Um, and yeah, I guess, thank you. Have a great rest of your year. Oh, yes. Karen. I want to say one thing. Mm -hmm. I want to thank Teddy because um, I've, I don't think I've ever been this proud of a student for putting together something like this. This is amazing what you've done. You've put in so much work. You've coordinated things. You've made people feel connected in this disconnected time. Um, and you've given access to so many people and inspiration to so many people. I've been tuning in every week. 
and I know a lot of people have. So thank you for everything you've done and for, for coming up with the idea and following through. Yeah. Very proud. Thanks. Um, yeah. So I guess that does it for our live stream. And yeah, thank you all. Bye, everyone. Bye.